Well, hey, good morning. How, uh, anybody get wet coming in this morning? Hey, I'm so proud of y'all for being here. You're the rain warriors. Let's stand. It's so good to be together this morning. Let us stand and let's worship together. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause she's done all this stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Good morning. I appreciate you uh, embracing the thunderstorms to get out this morning. Christy and I were joking, and she even said, if you weren't the pastor, we'd be home today. <laughs> so I am thrilled that I convinced her to get up and make it out here. Uh, and you can hear the thunder rolling all around us, but we're going to have a great time of worship and in God's Word. And I would ask you just be patient. If the power goes out, the mic kills out, it'll be good. I'll move down here and just speak a little louder if I have to. We'll make it through the day, okay? So let's just enjoy our time together. If you're visiting with us today, we are thrilled that you are here. You're an honored guest of ours, and we ask just a couple things of you. One is if on the bottom of your bulletin card, if you don't mind filling out just a little bit of information for us, at the end of the service, I am in the back. The second thing we ask of you is that you just come back there, say hello. Our church has a free gift for you that we'd love to present to you, and all you have to do is come by, say hello, and kind of hand us your card if you have it ready 
and let us have a moment to welcome you. We know a lot of people may be watching online, a lot of visitors. We have our virtual campus staff that are monitoring. If you want to put in the chat, chat box where you're watching from, if you have questions about our church, anything you hear during the sermon, feel free to correspond with us. We're here to serve you and help in any way that we can. You'll notice a lot of announcements on the front of your bulletin card, your message card, but a couple big ones we want to bring up is, one, we are moving into Easter season. It's hard to believe that it's here, uh, but next Sunday, if you will, in essence, kicks off Easter season, April the 2nd. Uh, and we're going to spend the month of Easter obviously looking at the resurrection of Christ, the death of Christ, his resurrection, how the women ran from the tomb. And then when Jesus ascended, kind of we're going to end Easter season with, well, what's he doing now? Where did he go? And what's he up to now as we wait for his return? So it's going to be a great season uh, that we walk through Easter. We made a video text invite available. If you've not received that, you can grab one of the staff, get one of the deacons, maybe your impact group leader. They all have it. We can make that available to you. It's a simple way just to forward out off of your phone and invite your friends to be here during the Easter season with us. We're going to end Easter season on April the 30th uh, with our starting point class right after the morning service. If you're not familiar with Starting Point, if you've been hanging out with us for a while and you want to partner with us and become an official member, that's how you connect. It's right after the morning service. The church provides lunch. We take care of your kids. All you have to do is register, tell us you're coming. Uh, and it's a class that you meet the staff. I share with you the vision of our church, where we're headed, kind of what's important to us. Uh, and that's how you get connected. That'll be on April the 30th. We will come back that night at six o'clock and we're gonna have a special concert with Matt Duran and his family. Matt Duran is the worship pastor at Eagles Landing First Baptist. He'll be here with his family to do a concert for us and tell their story. And we're gonna have the varsity food truck here to serve us dinner as we hang out and listen to worship. But here's what we ask. In order to make sure we got enough food, we need you to sign up. So in the lobby on one of the black high top tables, there's a piece of paper. You can sign up there that you're gonna be here on the 30th and that you plan to eat. You can do it through the app. You can go to the website. All we need you to do is pick how you want to register and let us know you're coming so we can let the varsity know how many hamburgers and hot dogs and onion rings and all that stuff to have ready for us, okay? So let us know. If you will, let's stand together. I'm going to pray for us. We'll continue our time of worship, and then we'll get into God's Word. Father, we love you, and we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the storms, the seasons that change. God, that we could walk out last week and everything is yellow, and we can walk out this week and, Lord, your rain is washing it clean. And I pray that in the midst of that, God, we would think about your grace, how it pours down on us, Father. And it cleanses us and renews us and makes things grow and brings life. And, Father, I pray this morning as we worship you that we would lift our voices in praise to our Creator, to our Redeemer, our Savior. God, that we would open your eternal book where you speak to us and we would hear it for what it is. It is you speaking to your people, showing us, leading us, guiding us into all truth, how we should live, what to expect in the future, God, the home that awaits us for those who are born again. And Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, that this morning you would just settle down in this place, that we would be encouraged through our fellowship with one another, but God, more than anything, that you would be honored, that we would be here for you, because Lord, there is so much for us to be thankful for, to pour out our heart of praise. And so Lord Jesus, we pray, this is your church. You lead us, let us follow, do what you wanna do in this place, and let's let us be your people. And we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Let's get into God's Word. We're working through the book of Jonah over the month, this month, and we're in chapter 4 today. We're wrapping up this series. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned some stuff, gained some insight into who Jonah is and some of the uh, characters, traits that are in him that are really in all of us. And uh, this morning, we're going to wrap it up and um, see what happened with this guy towards the end of his life and to the Ninevites. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Jonah. If you're not real familiar with your Bible, I would tell you, look in the table of contents. It's okay. We all had to do that at some point. Uh, but if you start at the book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, and go about eight books to the left, you will find Jonah. And as you're finding Jonah, let's kind of summarize where we've been on this journey and make sure we're all on the same page as we get into Jonah chapter 4. And one of the things we talked about early on in each week is really what is this book about? Uh, and we kind of challenged ourselves, and it's been kind of funny because a lot of you have come up and said, hey, I, I agree with you, Doug, and what you say about learning Jonah as a child. I didn't realize there was all this stuff in it. And we kind of talked about as kids, especially men, there was something really cool about studying the life of Jonah just like the life of Samson. It was interesting to think about a man living in the belly of a huge fish and getting spit up on the ground, and that's what would be taught as children in Sunday school. And so you kind of resonated with that as a guy, but one of the things we've learned in walking through this study, it's really not about a great fish. It's only mentioned four times, but yet it is where we spend a lot of our time. It's not even about a great city. The people of Nineveh, 120,000 people living in this city that God had called Jonah to go preach against and tell them a one-sentence sermon that we're going to get into a little bit more this morning. But it's not even about the people of Nineveh, this great city. They're mentioned nine times in the book. And it's not really even about Jonah, who we've learned is a disobedient prophet. He's only mentioned 18 times in his own book. What it's really about is God and how he is working. God is mentioned 38 different times in the book of Jonah. And so everything about Jonah, everything that's happening is pointing to these two main truths, these two main things that we have learned. And one is the call of God and how we respond to it and the love of God and how we share it. And all through this study, we've realized that God may not have called you or me to go to a city and preach to 120,000 people. That may not be the calling on your life, but it doesn't negate the fact that God calls us to do things. It doesn't take away from the fact that there are neighbors beside me and coworkers where God is saying, you are the ambassador. You represent, faith comes by hearing, share the gospel. God calls all of us and it's how we respond to it. And it's the love of God and how we share it. And this is where we're going to look at Jonah in chapter 4. How he responded to God demonstrating his love for the Ninevites. It's crazy to think about. And in Jonah chapter 1, just to give you a quick summary, we saw Jonah doing whatever Jonah was doing on a particular day at a certain time, at a pr precise moment, and God showed up and called to him and said, I want you to go and preach and we learned that when the Lord shows up with a message, it is authoritative. It is God saying to him, there is authority in what I'm telling you, and I expect you to respond in obedience. But then also when the Lord shows up and calls somebody to do something, he's saying, I want to do something new. I want to change something. And what he was wanting to change was Jonah and the direction of his life and the direction of the Ninevites. And so Jonah gets up, and he goes down to Joppa, and he finds a boat heading to Tarshish, 2,500 miles away from where God told him to go, and he takes off doing what he thought was running from the Lord, going in the exact opposite direction. And Jonah 1 begins to tell us that when he did that, God acted. 
And God sent a great wind. He sent a violent storm. And when the lot was cast and it fell to Jonah that they were in this situation because of his disobedience, they threw him overboard. And the Bible says God provided a huge fish to swallow him. And the main truth we learned out of Jonah chapter 1 is this. It is impossible to run from God. It's impossible to run from God. No matter how hard we try, no matter how long we run, it's impossible to do it. And that brings us into Jonah chapter 2. It ends in chapter 1. He's hanging out in the belly of this huge fish, and he's struggling, obviously, to be down there and survive. And he begins to find himself in this situation where Jonah chapter 2 says he's distressed, he's banished. He refers to it as life is ebbing away. And in the middle of that, it says, but Jonah cried out to the Lord. In the middle of this situation, this distress, he cries out to the Lord, and Jonah turns for the solution. And chapter 2 says he called out to God. He looked to him, and he remembered while he's sitting in the belly of this fish. And the Bible tells us that God answered him, that God heard his cry for help, that he brought him up, that he had this fish spit him up on the shore, and he gives him a second chance. And one of the big truths that we learned in Jonah chapter 2, if you were here that week, is that when Jonah is sitting in the belly of this fish and he is convinced that he is running from the Lord, that this fish is headed who knows where, God had actually turned that fish and was bringing it back to the shore and spits him up on the shore where the direction he wants him to go in. And many times that is exactly how it works in our life. And so the thing that resonated with us was this truth. Embrace the grace. Embrace the grace of God in your life. And that many times when it feels like it's chaos and there's too much coming down on you, like Jonah, I'm in distress, I'm kind of struggling here, could it be possible that God is orchestrating the events of your life to turn you to the purpose that he has for you? And this is where Jonah found himself. And the main truth of chapter 2 we, read, we learned was this, when, God, when we call, God hears. When we call out to him, God hears us. And in Jonah chapter 3, he's on this shore, this is where we were last week, going through this intense process that he's been through. And here he sits on this shore, and it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, and this time he obeyed. He learned something. He got up, and he went to Nineveh, and he walked into the city, and he preached a one-sentence sermon. Now, we kind of joked about this last week, that could you imagine if I got up here and gave one sentence, and then Ben came up, and we closed us out in worship, and we all left, and I just gave you one sentence you would feel like you got gypped. Like, what did you come out in the storm for? But this is what Jonah did. He walks into this city and says, hey, you have 40 days to repent or God's going to overthrow you. In 40 days, you're done. That was his message. And he went through this city preaching this message. And what we saw was it says the Ninevites believed God. And when the king heard the message, he made everybody, all 120,000 people, repent and put on sackcloth and not eat or drink anything from the highest to the lowest, including the animals, and turn to God. That's how they responded to Jonah's message. And we saw that everything changed in Jonah chapter 3. Jonah changed by responding in obedience. The Ninevites changed by responding in repentance. And God changed because it ended, the chapter ended with God saying, because they repented, he relented from what he was going to do to them. So there was change all over the place. And here's what we learned in Jonah chapter 3. God is a God of second chances. And he forgives those who repent. That's what we learned last week. So we're going to get caught up here in chapter 4 in just a second. But one thing I want you to think about as we dive into this last chapter and kind of wrap up what's going on in Jonah's life, think about the prodigal son in the New Testament. If you remember the prodigal son, he went to his father and he said, Hey, father, give me my share of the inheritance. The father gives it to him, and the Bible says he takes off to a distant country, kind of connect the dots to Jonah, heads off to a distant country, and it's, he says it blows all of his father's inheritance on wild and extravagant living. And he famine hits the land. He finds himself out of money. He's feeding pigs, and he's starving. And the prodigal son is saying, I would even eat what these pigs are eating. And in that moment, it registers to him. He says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up. And I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm going to tell him I'm sorry, and I'm going to repent of what I have done, and maybe he'll let me live as a servant in his house for the rest of my days. So he packs up, and he heads back to his father. And the Bible says when, God, when the father sees him coming, he runs to him, embraces him, forgives him, has a feast for him, invites all of his friends. And if you remember, what was the older brother doing? The older brother standing outside saying, I don't like this at all. I'm angry. I've been here the whole time serving you, Father. I have not spent your inheritance. I have done right, and you haven't thrown a party for me. Why do you do this for this rebellious one? 
And the father says, because the son who was dead is back from the dead. He's alive. He's returned. This is why we're celebrating. And you say, Doug, how in the world does that connect to Jonah? In Jonah chapter 1, you see the prodigal Jonah running from God. He returns to God and obeys him. And in Jonah chapter 4, you know what you see him doing? You see him being the older brother. You see in him, in him this characteristic that where we would celebrate 120,000 people came to know the Lord. Jonah's the older brother, and he says, God, this makes me angry. I can't believe you let these people repent. It's mind-blowing how he responds, and this is what we see. And the first time Jonah prayed, he prayed the best prayer in the worst place. Think about this. He prayed the best prayer in the worst place. He's in the belly of the fish, and his prayer is, God, repentance. I'm calling out to you. Forgive me. The best prayer in the worst place. The second time he prays, here in Jonah chapter 4, he prays the worst prayer in the best place. He's sitting outside of a city after 120,000 people have just repented and given their life to Christ. And he says, God, I wish I was dead. I can't believe you did this and gave forgiveness. Praise the worst prayer in the best place. So where we want to pick up is in verse, chapter 3, verse 10. And then as I told you, each week we're going to read the whole chapter. The whole book is only 48 verses long. So we're going to read all of chapter 4. And then we're going to walk through this and explain it. But let's pick up in 3.10 to get some context. When God saw what they did, talking about the Ninevites, and how they turned from their evil ways, God changed. He relented, and he did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Now watch this. But to Jonah, this seemed wrong. This seemed wrong to Jonah. And he became angry, and he prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? Remember chapter 1 when God first called him? Isn't this what I told you, Lord, when I was there? This is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. Now listen to what Jonah is saying. He is saying in that, in essence, God, I knew what you were going to do regardless. I was just trying to stall it out. That's why I fled to Tarshish. And I told you when I was there and you called me. This is why I was running, because I knew who you were. Watch what he says. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. He knew the character of God, and he didn't like it. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. So he's out there pouting, waiting to see if on day 41, God's going to strike them all dead. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Is that not crazy? He's happy about a plant. Now listen, if we could just pause right there for a second and get our brain around this, because this is kind of mind-blowing for me. 120,000 people have just repented, believed in God, and turned away, and God relented from disaster. And Jonah was the messenger that preached the sermon that turned him. Now, God did it, but he was the messenger that God used. And Jonah sits there, and if you could picture in your mind 120,000 people gathered up on one side of this auditorium who, listen, church, are eternal souls. They will live forever somewhere and they've all believed, and Jonah says, I am not happy about that. But he looks over here, and he sees a little plant, and he says, but this makes me happy. Is that not mind-blowing to you? I, I just want to get our brain around where his heart is and where his mind is, and here's where I want us to be careful. What we're going to see is that's an attitude that can be in all of us. That here in this moment, we may say, there is no way I would be upset looking at 120,000 people who have believed in Christ that are standing in line, waiting to be baptized, waiting to get into a small group in our church, and I turn over here and see a plant and say, but that's what really makes me happy. Look what happens. This is where Jonah's mind is. He was happy about the plant, but at dawn the next day, what did God do? God provided a worm. It chewed the plant so that it withered up. When the sun rose, God then provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I was dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it, listen to his language, and you did not make it grow. Jonah, you did nothing 
for the plant. You never tended to it. You didn't plant it. You didn't cause it to grow. What is God saying? But think about these Ninevites. It sprang up overnight and the plant died. Verse 11, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? People that he tended to, people that he grew, people that he created, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. And that's how the book ends. That's how the story of Jonah ends for this part of it. And when the verse two, when Jonah says, God, I knew that you were slow to anger, I would tell you, if I was Jonah's friend in this moment, I would pull him aside and say, dude, you need to keep your mouth shut. (laughs) Do you remember what you just said? He's slow to anger. Can you see how you're pressing in on that? That you're happy about a plant and angry about 120,000 people? It's mind-blowing where his mind is. But it is something that can be true for every single one of us. And so the main truth I want us to see as we wrap up this series is this. Out of chapter 4, God is gracious and compassionate slow to anger, and he's abounding in love. That's verse 2. That's what, that's what we want to get our head around this morning. God is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger, and he is abounding in love. And if the book of Jonah had ended in chapter 3, verse 10, history would have portrayed Jonah as one of the greatest prophets who ever lived, a one-sentence sermon that brought 120,000 people to repentance and to believe in God is amazing. If that has, is where it had ended... Now, to help us get our perspective around this, I did some research. If you could imagine an entire community turning to God. So I started doing some research. And as of the 2021 census, they don't have 2022, Butts County has 25,781 residents living in it. Roughly 26,000 people living in Butts County. The city of Nineveh had 120,000 people that all repented and turned to God and believed in him. Now, think about this. It is mind-blowing. The people of Nineveh Nineveh is almost five times, almost five times the population of Butts County. What we're seeing here, what we're reading would be the entire county all repented, all believed in God, and all flooded our church. Would you be happy or would you be frustrated? Be careful how you answer that. Because I think for many of us, if we ask ourselves, how would we respond? We may respond although I don't think we'd have the nerve to do it publicly, we may respond a little bit like Jonah would. You would hope that we would rejoice, yet in chapter 4 we see in Jonah kind of a snapshot of an attitude that's in all of us. Why is that? Because it might create some inconvenience for us. Can you imagine 26,000 people walking on our campus this morning who all said, hey, I have believed in Jesus and I need a church to help me? And it was on us There would be a part of us that say, hey, this is a little inconvenient. Because when you walk in the auditorium, if there's 26,000 people sitting here, guess where your seat is? It may be in the parking lot. You may be watching virtually down the hallway through a screen. You see where we're going with this? There may be a part of us that says, hey, this is a little inconvenient. It's not usual. It's out of the norm. It may mean that we don't have enough classrooms on campus to put everybody into an impact group and disciple them. So we come to you and say, hey, we need your home. We need you to take in 20 people into your house and every week open up your home, have some food, teach them the word of God. And you may say, I don't want any part of that. I don't want people, all of a sudden it starts, you can feel the weight of how this is really in all of us. It's very easy to look at it in Jonah, but it's true for all of us. We may say, hey, I'm used to the church kind of serving, serving and catering to the way I like things. It's very routine. I'm very comfortable in it. And now all of a sudden, everything's out the window, and we have to rethink how we do everything. Think about 26,000 people walking on campus. What do we do with our children's ministry? Imagine poor Ella. You think we need nursery workers now? This is what we're dealing with. This is where Jonah's at. Here's the other thing that may be true. If 26,000 people in Butts County repented, turned their life over to Jesus Christ, and showed up in this church, that means there may be people in this county that you don't really care for. And all of a sudden, they're sitting right next to you in church. All of a sudden, they're worshiping the same God that you've been worshiping here. And here you sit. What are you going to do? This is where Jonah's living, so it's very easy for us to look at this and say, Jonah, you are crazy. I can't believe you responded that way. But if we stop and really inspect our hearts and our guts and where we are with the Lord, we would be very similar in our response. Here's what was true about Jonah. For Jonah, the body obeyed, but the heart was still in rebellion to God's plan. 
That's what we see to be true in all of us. There are many times our body will physically obey, but our hearts may still be in rebellion. And it's a scary place to be, but we're all there. So there's two main things happening in the book of Jonah, chapter 4, that we're going to walk through this morning as we close this out. One is the character of Jonah, and the other is the character of God. The character of God and the character of Jonah. This is really what you see. Chapter 4 is a dialogue between God and Jonah. But let's start out with the character of God. And one of the first things that we learn in that second verse is that God is gracious that's what the Bible tells us. He is gracious. He is a God who is gracious. And that means he responds with favor to the inferior. He responds with favor to the inferior. Now, let me illustrate this for you so we can get our brain around it. Since we're in baseball season, you ever seen a baseball player who's like a star home run hitter? And as he's warming up before a game and hitting home runs over the fence, there's a little kid with his dad watching. That might be you. You might have had that experience with your kids, or you might have been that kid. And that kid is wide-eyed wonder watching their hero smash home runs over the fence. And when he's done at ball practice, he walks by, and that little boy is standing there. That man owes him no time, nothing. And he turns to that little boy, signs his baseball bat, and hands it to him, and pats him on the head and walks off. That is the simplest, minute way to try and grasp the graciousness of God. A little boy who is probably pl pay, playing wreck, learning how to hit a ball off a tee, watching his major league hero turn to him who owes him no time and owes him nothing, but graciously says, I'm going to sign my bat and give it to you. That boy will probably be 30, 40, 50 years old saying, let me show you my bat. <laughs> this, is what, this is an image of what it looks like. If you want to think of it scripturally, think of Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah walks into the presence of God, and there God sits high and lifted up on his throne, the seraphim flying around him, screaming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And when he does it, the temple is shaking and it fills with smoke. And what does Isaiah say? Woe is me. I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. But now my eyes have seen the king. And it says a seraphim flies over, touches his lips and says, hey, see this coal? It's removed your guilt. Your sin is atoned for. It is the inferior responding to us, the, the inferior of us responding to the greatness of who God is. He responds with favor to the inferior. This is what we're dealing with. God is gracious because he is love. It is his character to love, even if love is not returned to him. He will give us good things because of his goodness, not because of mine or yours. He extends favor, mercy, and kindness on whoever he pleases. It's who he is. God is gracious because he is our creator, even when we don't acknowledge him, worship him, he still endows us with things because he wants to. It is who he is. God created mankind as good, and he won't turn his back on his creatures or creation. When he created us and breathed life into us, this is what he's seen in the people of Nineveh. This is why he can say, Jonah, you didn't plant that tree, that plant. You didn't tend to it. You didn't make it grow. Why should I not care about the people of Nineveh? Created in my image, breathed life, living for eternity somewhere when they pass. God is gracious. Now listen to this. Here's what Millard Erickson described it. It says, grace is another attribute that is part of the manifold of God's love. By this we mean that God deals with his people not on the basis of their merit or worthiness or what they deserve, but simply according to their need. In other words, he deals with them on the basis of his goodness and his generosity. That's what, how you can think about this graciousness, that God doesn't look at us and say, I'm going to deal with you as your sins deserve. I'm going to deal with you graciously. And I hope as the people of God, we would say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for not dealing with me for what I deserve, but extending to me grace. This is what Jonah says, I am angry, God, because you're that. Is that not crazy to think about? I'm angry and I want to die because you're gracious and you give people what they don't deserve. Or what, yes, you give people what they don't deserve. This is what makes him angry. The second thing he says this, compassion. Look, look at this. He says, you're compassionate. This is with great love. God stretches out his care and sees the weak and those who need his protection. There's two main thoughts in the Hebrew language about compassion. Don't miss this. The first one is this, intense emotion or action. In, intense emotion or action. And what this means simply is this. Without getting too far into the Hebrew, and don't be impressed, I do not know Hebrew and Greek. But I have a Bible that tells me what they mean, so I look them up, almost like a dictionary. 
But in the Hebrew, this word compassion has to do and relates to the womb. Now, you may think, well, what in the world? Where are we going with this? Stay with me. Compassion in the Old Testament and what we see being demonstrated here in Jonah is at the core of who a person is. It means in the guts, I hurt, I ache, that there's compassion here. So it's this emotional feeling, but then it's also tied to action. It's not just saying, I hurt for that person. It is saying, I hurt in the deep part of who I am. This is what God is. He is gracious and he is compassionate. If you want to get your brain around what this looks like in an illustration, think of King Solomon. You may remember there was a time when two women had just given birth to children and one of them had died. But both of them stood before the king and said the baby that was living was theirs. So two women arguing over one child and Solomon's trying to make a decision of, well, who's the mother? So what does he do? He calls in a man and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your sword I want you to cut this child in half and give half of it to each mother. You know what the real mother does? The real mother, compassion, deep in her gut, falls to her knees and says, please, please don't do that. Give the child to her. I would rather see it live and be raised by her than to see my child harm. And what does Solomon say? You're the real mom. Why? Because he saw in her this deep hurt of a mother for her children, but didn't just say, I hurt. She said, No, I got to do something. I have to protect my child. Listen, when Jonah says, you're a God of grace and you're a God of compassion, he is angry that God deep in his gut hurts for people and says, I will act and I will do something about it. And when God took on flesh and he walked among us, Mark chapter one, there's an event where as he's moving, a leper comes up. You may remember this. And the leper says to him, Lord, he falls to his knees and says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the Bible says Jesus moved with compassion, hurting in his gut for who this man is, how he has suffered his whole life with leprosy, leans over and says, I am willing, be clean. Is that not powerful to think about? This is the God that we serve. This is the God who comes to us at Macedonia and says, hey, I'm inviting you in. Be a believer, follow me. I'm inviting you into the work that I'm doing in the world to redeem mankind. He is a God of graciousness and compassion. So when you think about this word compassion being action, it's mainly used to describe how God acts. In Isaiah 49, it says this, just to kind of connect this thought to the womb. It says, can a mother forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the child she is born? Though she may forget, God says, I'll never forget. This is the compassion of how God is. Here's what compassion does. It gets involved. It gets involved. And one of the things we can take to heart from this last chapter, Jonah chapter 4, is this. We need that same compassion. God invites us in and says, you're the hands and feet of Jesus. We are it. And it's not enough for us to just look at somebody and have pity and say, man, I sure do feel sorry that you're struggling. We need to be the people of God in the church that goes out in Butts County and says, we will hurt for people who are hurting in our communities, and we will do something. This is why if you were here on Vision Sunday, we said we're gonna partner with DFACS, and we're doing that. And we're doing all we can to love the people that work at that center and support them and help those kids that are in that foster care program. It's why we've had volunteers through our impact groups going up to Operation Lunchbox. And we stand there and put food in a box that gets delivered to families who are hungry and kids who need food. Why do we do that? Because we need something else to do on a Thursday night? No, we all got plenty to do. We do that because I pray as a church there's something in our gut that says we hurt for people who are suffering around us. And walking up to somebody's house and handing them a box of food, saying we don't want you to go hungry and we love you and Jesus loves you, it's the compassion of Jesus coming out in us. This is what he's called us to do. Frederick Buckner described it this way. Listen, it's a beautiful definition. Compassion is sometimes the fatal capacity for feeling what it is like to live inside somebody else's skin. It is the knowledge that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy finally for you too. Think about that statement. This is how he described compassion. Biblically, the compassion of the Lord is, I cannot live at peace while my brother or sister suffer. 
and I must be moved to act. And when they are at peace, I will feel peace. And I would say of myself, that is so far from many times how I respond to people. But I pray we will learn to be compassionate as God is compassionate and be thankful that he's compassionate towards us. That he didn't look at us and say, hey, I know you're in your sin. I know you're struggling through something. Good luck with that. But that he moved in to help us. The other thing Jonah tells us that I want us to look at, look at this. He says God is slow to anger. Slow to anger. God delays his righteous anger as long as possible. Now, this is where it gets a little crazy, so stay with me. That Hebrew word, slow to anger, means long of nose. And you may say, well, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard of, but I hope it resonates and it's something you can remember. It means long of nose. Think of it this way. If we say thank you in the U.S. in English, we say thank you, and that means I appreciate what you've done for me. If you were to say thank you in French, you would say merci. If you were saying it in German, you would say danke. If you were saying it in Japanese, you would say damo arigato. But in all three of those, it is somebody saying, no matter how it's worded, I appreciate what you have just done for me. The message behind it is communicated regardless of the word. So when the Bible says that he is slow to anger, he is long of nose, and you say, what does that mean? It means the same thing. It's just in the Hebrew, they didn't go around and talk that way. They didn't say, oh, he has a, he's a very patient man. They would say he's long of nose. What do they mean by that? When a person becomes angry, their nose or their face typically becomes red. With me on that? You can physically see them getting angry. So the Hebrews would say, God is long of nose. It takes a very long time for his face to turn red, for his nose to turn red in anger towards his people. This is what they were communicating. This is why a person is called long-nosed in the Hebrew. Romans 2.4 tells us this, God's kindness, what is that? His slow to anger, his ability to not get mad quickly is intended to lead you to repentance. You ever thought about that? That when God delays in passing his judgment, when he relents from being on the people of Nineveh, what you're seeing in him is him saying, I don't get angry quickly. I am being kind towards you so that you will repent and turn and do the right. And there should be a part of us that says, thank you, Lord, that you are slow to anger. You ever been around somebody that has a short fuse? Yeah, all of us have. You may be that person. I don't know. Sorry. Well, we've all been around people that have a short fuse. and It doesn't take much, and they're angry. Think about if God was that way. If God was not long-nosed, if he was not slow to anger, if every little thing just set him off, man, that would be a terrible way to live. But he is slow to anger, and Jonah says, I don't like it, God. Look at the last one he says. He's abounding in love. Abounding is in love. His love is inexhaustible. Out the love of God. It refers to this overflowing measure of love that is far beyond all human capacity to produce or describe. The original Greek, when it talks about abound, means this: to run over, to be wealthy, to have more than enough, transcending all boundaries. Get this in your head. When Jonah says, God, I ran because I know you're abounding in love. It means you overflow with love. There is no end to it. It is always there for people. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 13, he described love. Now, I want you to think about this verse as it's on the screen with the definition of abounding on top of it. To run over, be wealthy, have more than enough, transcending all boundaries. This is who God is. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. God's love is patient. It runs over. He is wealthy in patient love. He has more than enough of his patient love. See how we're doing this? Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. God's love is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is never self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It is always protecting, always trusting, always hoping, and always persevering. God is that kind of God, an abundance of love. And I thank the Lord that he is. It's the kind of love that I need to carry me through life, to sustain me, and not only get me through this life, but to present me perfectly holy and blameless before a righteous and holy God. This abounding in love that God has. So as we walk through these characteristics, 
There's a part of us that may say, and I am so thankful. God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. I am so thankful. I am so joyful. But if you read how Jonah words it in this chapter, he almost lists it like they're negatives. Like, God, I can't believe you are this way. And in verse 2, Jonah says, because I knew you were that kind of God, I knew you were patient, I knew you were forgiving, and I knew you would receive those that repent. That's why I ran. God, it's all your fault that you've done this. It's your character that has made me do what I did. It's crazy to think about. And here's what I would tell you. For any man of God's creation to stand before the Creator and to make accusations that God's perfect nature is somehow imperfect is borderline blasphemy. For Jonah to stand before God and say, your perfect, loving, patient, abounding in love nature is wrong. It is almost evil. But on Jonah's comments, the only way he would have been happy is if God would have turned a deaf ear to the Ninevites. This is what he's saying. The only way Jonah would have thought things were made right was if God turned away from their cry for repentance. Jonah preferred that that he served a God who turned a deaf ear to their cries of mercy and forgiveness and that only do it in their case, not in his. Do you see the irony here of what's building? God is saying, I knew you were that way, and I wish you didn't respond that way to the Ninevites, but when I was in the belly of the fish, man, respond to me that way. Be that kind of God, slow to anger, abounding in love. That's what I want, but don't do it for them. And it's a characteristic that can be in the heart of us too, that we want God to treat us in a certain way, to hear our prayer of cry, to forgive my sins, But when it comes to maybe somebody that we're an enemy of, we don't care for too much. We may say, but don't hear that prayer, God. It's a very dangerous place to live. This is where Jonah was, and the Bible says he was angry. The Hebrew word for anger here is to be hot, to blaze, to burn. If you read it literally as it was written, it would say this, it was evil to Jonah with great evil. So it wasn't just that he was angry. He, in essence, thought God had done some great evil to these people to the point that he says, I'd rather die. I would rather die. And if there has ever been an example in Scripture of why it's good that God sometimes does not answer our prayers, this would probably be one of them. That Jonah is so angry and burning, and he sees it as evil, he says, I would rather die. What if God was not slow to anger and said, okay, we'll make that wish come true. But even in dealing with Jonah in this moment, he works with him and uses a plant to teach him and to show him his grace and his mercy. The irony is that the only reason Jonah was able to stand before God in this moment and make these complaints was because God was willing to hear him earlier in the belly and respond in mercy. It's the only reason he's standing here now and has the ability to say to God, I'm angry at you, I don't like the way you did things, was because of God's mercy. And now he's being critical of it. But it's true for all of us. And what we see as we walk through this, and we're closing out with this, this story of Jonah, these final thoughts, is this character of Jonah. And one of the things we see is as Jonah becomes angry towards God, he quits serving God. It's kind of what you see happening here when it says he goes through the city for three days and he preaches a one-sentence message. And now that you got a little insight into what was in his heart, his body was physically in Nineveh preaching, but his heart was far away from the plans of God. He was angry towards God. He goes through and you cannot, you know, almost picture Jonah preaching this message. It probably was not very passionate. He probably just said, hey guys, you got 40 days to repent, and God's going to overthrow you. And he goes outside this city, and he sits down. He begins to pull away from and quit serving God. And I would say for many of us, that's what we do. We become frustrated with what God does or doesn't do and how we think he should or should not respond. And in that frustration, we say, well, I'm just going to give up. What's the point? So he goes and sits outside the city and pouts. The other thing that you see in Jonah's character, even outside the things we've already talked about, is he starts to separate himself from others. We do this too. We become angry, frustrated, living in sin. We distance ourselves. We pull away. We separate ourselves from other people, and we sit in in isolation. And then finally, Jonah becomes the spectator. The Bible says he's just sitting out there waiting to see what God does. Is God going to relent, or is God going to follow through with what he said? He is just sitting, watching. And we understand what God does. Now, here's where it gets crazy. We're going to wrap up with this. If you want to turn there, you can. But Matthew chapter 12 Verses 38 through 41. Write this one down. You can read it later or check it out now. It's amazing what happens here. And this leads us into the Easter season. 
When Jesus is on the scene in Matthew chapter 12, the Bible says that a demon-possessed man who is blind and mute approaches him. And Jesus casts this demon out of this man and gives him the ability to speak and hear. Now stay with me. We're wrapping up this whole study right here. He gives him the ability to hear and speak. And the people, the religious leaders that are around Jesus say, the only way you're able to do that is by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of Satan. They give credit to something Jesus did to Satan. And so as this builds out and Jesus is having this conversation with him, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, the Pharisees come to him and they say, Jesus, give us a sign. What were they saying? Do a trick. Let's rub the genie bottle and see what Jesus does. Give us a trick. And Jesus says, I'm not going to give you a sign. A wicked generation asks for a sign. Here's what he says. The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. Don't miss this. Jesus himself. Now, here's what's mind-blowing. The same God who called Jonah the first time when Jonah ran, the same God who caused the wind, caused the fish, had him thrown overboard, the same God who gave him a second chance, who brought him to Nineveh to allow the people to repent, the same God that Jonah questioned now stands before a demon-possessed mute man and religious leaders and said, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. And the same way he was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, Jesus says, I'm going to be in the earth three days and three nights. What's he talking about? He's talking about his death and resurrection. And here's what's crazy. As he wraps up this conversation with the Pharisees, here's what he says. He says, when the judgment day comes, don't miss this, church. He said, the people of Nineveh, these 120,000 people that repented, are going to rise up and they're going to condemn you. Is that not crazy to think about? that these wicked Ninevite people that Jonah goes to preaches a message, they believe in God and repent, Jesus shows up and says, back then I'm the same Jesus that called Jonah, I'm the same Jesus that was there then that forgave those people, and those people will rise up and condemn and judge you religious leaders because something greater than Jonah is here. Do you see it? Jonah is one man preaching a one-sentence message and 120,000 people repent. Jesus is right in front of their face, healing demon-possessed, raising the dead, feeding thousands of people, and all people could say is, do another trick. Show us another sign. And Jesus said, I am him right in front of your face, and you don't see it. And it kind of resonates with us a little bit. It kind of speaks to me of how many years did I sit in church, heard sermons, sat in small groups, taught small groups. How many years was Jesus right in front of my face? And yet I still said, I want to do it my way. I'm going to choose my sins. I want to walk the way I want to walk. I don't want to be inconvenienced. And here Jesus brings this whole thing forward and says, something greater than Jonah is right in front of you. And I would tell you this morning, church, as we close out this series, the same is true for us. Something greater than the book of Jonah, someone greater than Jonah is standing right in front of you this morning and saying that he is gracious and he is compassionate towards you and he is slow to anger and he is abounding in love and he is inviting you to say, follow me, believe in me. There's greater things ahead. And we could spend this series of Jonah and say, that is great, but you know what? I'm going to go however many more years I got with Jesus right in front of me and still do it my way. Very dangerous place to live. Or we could say, I see it. I get it. I recognize who Jesus is, and I want to turn and believe and put my faith in him and allow him to do something wonderful in your life. So I invite you to stand with me this morning as we close out this series. And a couple things I would invite you to do as the praise team gets settled in. Let me talk to one group of people in the room. The Bible makes it clear at the end of times, there's really only two kinds of people. And they're not divided by race, politics, where you live, anything. It's those that know Jesus and those that don't. That's it. And so if you stand in this moment and you say, I'm not sure that I know Jesus, can I speak to you for a second? The Bible wants you to know, and our church wants you to know, that Jesus loves you more than anything. 
He loves you so much, so full of compassion, that he didn't say, I'm gonna leave you like you are and hope you figure it out. He was so full of compassion in his gut hurting for you that he came to earth, took on skin, was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin, and allowed himself to be nailed to a cross to say to us, if you will simply believe and receive the free gift of salvation, it's yours. That's all it takes. And we stumble over that so many times because it's hard for us to get our head around it. We always think, well, I gotta be at church every Sunday and I gotta do and I gotta do. And Jesus says, you, you've missed the whole point. It's a free gift. You don't have to do anything except believe. That's what he asks of you. And so this morning, I would simply ask you, if you have never come to a place in your life that you have believed on the Lord Jesus, would you do that today? Would you see him for who he is right in front of you, a God who is slow to anger, full of compassion, gracious, loving, bounding in love, and he calling you into his kingdom? And if you have done that this morning, you say, I believe in who Jesus is, I want to invite you to do one of two things. At the end of the service, I'll be in the back of the room. The simplest thing you can do is walk back there and say, I really don't understand everything you're talking about, but I believed in Jesus today. And I would love nothing more than to walk you through what has happened to you, who Jesus is. You are a new creation. God has changed you. And he wants to do something wonderful in your life. I would love to show you that truth. Or the second thing you could do is on your sermon note card at the bottom, there's a place that says, I received Christ today. You can check that and bring it to the back and we will follow up with you. We will help you understand what God has done for you and more details about what this Christian life means. Why we gather here every week and worship. Why we serve one another. Why we go out in our community and feed children. We'll help you understand all of that about who we are. But it's what God has done for you. So would you please, if you've never believed in Jesus, believe on him today. Put your faith and trust in Christ. For those of you in the room that say, the second group of people, I know I know Jesus. I'm a believer. I am truly born again. I know him. How does this sermon resonate with you? This series, thinking it through, the, the characteristics of Jonah. What has God called you to do that you're running from? What does God want you to do with your life? Maybe it's time through this series that you say, I'm going to give up doing it my way. And even though it's scary, I'm going to go this way and follow the Lord and do what he wants me to do. Walk in obedience to what he wants to do in your life. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for the book of Jonah. And Lord, it has always amazed me when I read about men and women of the Bible. I'm so thankful that you don't write about my life for thousands of years for people to read about. God, but I am thankful that you write about Jonah and you give us insight into this man. You give us insight to the people of Nineveh, how you work, how you move, and you tell us clearly, right in front of our face, that you're gracious, you're compassionate, you're slow to anger, and you're abounding in love. And Lord, I pray for those in the room that have never believed in you, Spirit of God, move in their heart, call them to salvation, allow them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, for those of us who do know you, it is my prayer that as a church we will move forward. And God, we will say, bring us the 26,000. Let us see people turn from their sins, put their faith in Jesus. Give us an opportunity to disciple them, to grow them in their faith, to baptize them, to help introduce them to the eternal life that now resides in them and that is theirs by promise through you. Lord, use our church, use us as your people in a mighty way in the time that you give us. Let us change the population of heaven because of the work we do in the time that you give us. And we thank you and praise you for all these things. In Christ's name, amen.
Amen. It's been a great morning. Just a reminder, please uh, make sure you sign up for uh, the fifth Sunday gathering on April 30th with Varsity Food Truck and Matt Duran and his family in concert. Um, just want to say again, we're so thankful for uh, the visitors. If you are a member or regular attender, will you let our visitors know how glad we are they're here? Now let's go be the hands and feet of Jesus. You are.